Well, Ian, thank you for joining us to look back on your time as Northampton Town Manager. We'll, we'll start at the beginning. Um, the 94-95 season, you came in in January 95 and fair to say you took over a, a struggling squad. Yeah, it was. I mean, I think everybody's got to bear in mind that the, uh, the the club had moved into the new stadium and everybody thought that the club, because of that new stadium, was suddenly going to get promoted and, and do everything. But things don't work out like that. And money was still very, very tight. And John Barman would have been the manager and he, he'd actually tried to work the Oracle, um, bringing players in, some out of the non-league, Neil Grayson, people of that nature. And... Um, it was probably like a brand new team and, and initially they struggled and they struggled to get results. So as whatever happens, you get to a Christmas period and clubs are struggling and John left the club and, and then I was invited to come and take over as manager. And in that, in, in those first few weeks, I think it's fair to say you, you inherited a squad, as you said, with a, a few non-league, former non-league players in there. But you also, one of the first things you did, you brought in the likes of Chris Burns and Darren Hughes, players that had a lot of league experience to add them to the squad. We did, and I think what was, I identified straight away. I mean, my first game with Gillingham at home, and I, mean, I think we had about 6,000 there as well, which was fantastic. I think the, the, the beauty of Northampton at that, that, that time was, well, those were struggling with results. We had the new stadium, and, and the supporters were turning up in the droves still because of that stadium, and they were, we were getting five and a half, six, six and a half thousand people. That would have been the county ground. You'd probably still been getting 1,500 or 2,000. So initially, we, I, I looked at the team and thought he did. He's obviously got weaknesses. Um, John has done the best he could with the finances he had to get the players in, and I just felt that we needed uh, what I call Division Two players, which was a little bit of height, a little bit of power, and a little bit of strength. And um, I remember going out straight away and getting Nicky Smith as uh, as a left back, and and Burns, who came from Portsmouth, who I'd known a little bit of out the non-league from Gloucester. Uh, but the big the big one was Gary Thompson, because Gary, who was then 34, probably just going to 35, was at Cardiff City. He played at the highest level. And we just needed someone like that to lead the line and probably help people like Grayson and Martin Aldridge out. Um, and Gary did. And you always knew that you could get the ball forward, you could get the ball in the box, and Gary would either head it or keep it in there. And regardless of what people think, that was a big feature of the years when I was at Northampton is everybody had a reasonably big side and, and it, it was they were a powerful side and they were a strong side and if you could defend one box which is our own and you had someone who could head it in the other one um, and you put the ball in there then that's what the second division was about you had to you'd defend the one box and attack the other one either in normal play or set pieces and we set about that we set about the organisation of the team um and also we were exceptionally hard on set pieces, but shape, 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 because it was just about survival and getting to the end of the season and keeping the club in the league. Results did did improve and you moved up the table. And you could, I think looking back now, you could see the beginnings of, of, a, of the side forming with players in there who would go on to play significant parts. You obviously inherited the likes of Grayson, Sampson, Warburton, and you bought in then, um, as, you know, as you've touched on there, um, Burns came in, Gary Thompson came in, but you also saw the likes of O'Shea and Woodman. So you you were beginning already in those few months to see the sort of characters come forward who would help who would help you to take the team forward. Yeah, it did. I mean, bear in mind as well is that the the, the the club before that the the season I took over had obviously had, had stayed up um, against Shrewsbury Town two 0 down. I think at half time, come back one three two. The Kidderminster Stadium as well. I mean, wasn't up to scratch, and he had a, a, like a losing culture, and he had a bit of a despair about because of the results. And uh, I didn't realise what a well-supported club he was when I took over, and to get that amount through the turnstile every week of five and a half, six thousand, when you're close in the bottom two, bottom three of the division, is testimony to the, the the supporters. You know what I mean? And all those supporters as well that basically were at the county ground with the buckets, picking the money up, you know what I mean, to help the club survive. But we did, and, and, and results, looking back at the results, results define things, certainly, and bringing people like Andy Woodman in, uh, it was really on the back of getting beat 5-0 at home by Berry. Um, Billy Stewart was in goal, who uh, was a good goalkeeper by rights, but 
had had a tough season because possibly maybe what was in front of him as well and they hadn't defended particularly well. But that night told me I needed a goalkeeper. Um, and after the game, I got in touch with Crystal Palace. Andy Woodman came down the next day with his dad, believe it or not, <laughs> to hold his hand. So he, <laughs> he came down and, and Andy came in and his first game was watched all away. We drew nil nil. Had a clean sheet again the following week as well. And the rest is history for Andy because he became a, a big crowd favourite. Um, he hadn't played league football before. Um, and it was the first to admit that as a team built, he had three fantastic centre-halves in front of him, whoever they were. You, you sort of carried on the, the, the improvement from the second half of that season into the 95-96 season. And in that sort of August 95, you kicked off and, and again... You kicked off the new season with a, another, you know, a, another set of new arrivals. I'm thinking Roy Hunter and Dean Peer came in, players who would go on to play their part in, um, in the success of the years to come. So really, sort of that 95-96 season was another season of progress, albeit it was a top half finish and not quite at the playoff stage yet. No, and what we tried to do is, uh, I tend to do again, as I said, it was second division, first division football, and. You, you, to me, you need people who've got big hearts, and the, the people I tried to bring in, I, I, I knew what I wanted to have a good character. I knew that they'd pull the shirt on and give everything. Um, people might have criticised them a little bit technically, but sometimes it's the money that you've got available that will bring the type of player you bring to the club, and that was a little bit the case. So I went for players I could rely on as much as probably spending more money on a technical player, but you might only get one game of one good game out of every five. And the people the people like Dean Peer that we that I knew from the Birmingham days anyway, I knew I could rely on him. Um and people like Roy Hunter, I mean Roy came from West Brom coming out of the reserves. And I remember Roy Hunter for the first I think it was six months of his career at Northampton, he was on something like a hundred pounds a week. Just like basically that's all we could give him and we gave him expenses. And he turned up for training every day. His enthusiasm was was spreading amongst the players as well. Do you know what I mean? And he earned his contract in the end. But initially, we couldn't give him a contract. We just had to give him a part-time one. So we, we, I, I knew the kind of player that we, I wanted. I was lucky enough to get those kind of people in who wanted to come and play for the club. Um, and basically, we formed a very good team spirit. Um, a togetherness that was difficult to break down. And a system that was difficult to break down as well and we, we we basically set about it that way and, and teams didn't like playing against Northampton it was similar to that because of the energy we played with and the, the heart and spirit we played with When you got to the end of that sort of 95-96 season could you the league position says you were heading the right way but did you sort of feel the momentum was beginning to build within that group that you had? Yeah I think it was I mean we I mean, it was, a, it was a gradual building. I mean, if I was, remember right, I was a little bit disappointed that we, we possibly, I think we finished 11th in the league, that we, we may have finished a little bit closer. But, I mean, that's me because, I'm, I'm again, I was like, I'm 24 hours, as a manager, 24 hours intense. Uh, you kept driving the players as much as anything. You kept trying to motivate the players with different techniques. Um, and you could feel a, a, a sense of a building of the club as well. We've got one or two young players coming through as well, like Chris Lee, who I bought from Doncaster as well, who was only 20. I thought throughout his career he should have done better. But as you say, we, we had a strong back four with, or back three with Razor, Sammy, and then uh, people, people like Ian Brightwell came in as well. Or David Brightwell, sorry. Um, and they formed a very strong three in front of, uh, of Andy in the end. Then it was in, on to the 96-97 season. Now, as we all know, it ended up with success at Wembley. But um, to, to, we'll go back to the start of that season. Ian Clarkson was um, a new addition to the side at the start of that season. And I think he, for a player that was possibly quite a, a, someone of an unsung hero at the time he was there. But when you look back, someone like him actually had quite a big impact and a big influence not just on the team but on the dressing room and um, was probably another one you would put in the bracket of one of your trusted players who you knew what you get from him well you, you did and again well, we, we, I was delighted because he, he was playing for Stoke City um, in the division of Butler and they'd been in the championship um, and 
again, I'd, I'd known him from his apprenticeship days at Birmingham when I've played there as assistant manager. And Ian actually rang me and asked whether I'd be interested and I couldn't believe my luck. So suddenly someone of that ex- little bit of experience, he was still young enough, Ian, but his experience of playing at the, the higher level as well. But not only that, he epitomised the team. Ian Clarkson was had a strong heart and he played to win. And you knew what you were going to get every week. I didn't have to tell Ian Clarkson. We set a system out and just said, right, I, as I say, he's one of those sometimes. If, if a Friday night, you'll say, well, I can put me out on people. And Ian Clarkson epitomised the team. But then that led into Ian Samson. It went into Ray Wilburton. It got into Brightwell. It was into Woodman. Um, and Dean Pierre. Then suddenly Hunty, uh, Hunty came to the club as well. And, and Roy Hunter and Parrish, Sean Parrish as well. And you look at that like you think, cool, blimey. If anybody beats us, they deserve to beat us because they were never going to beat us for heart and spirit uh, and a desire. Uh, but they could play as well. And I don't think they were giving us the credit they deserved because they could play. Um, but the, the main course of it is they were blooming hard to beat. The, as we know, the season had a fantastic ending and we'll, we'll come on to the, the playoffs and, and the playoff final in a moment. But it wasn't all plain sailing, was it, that season? Because sort of around Christmas time, it, I, th- I think it was around the mid-table position we were in. So it was really a run to the playoffs that was based around the fantastic second half of the season. It was. It was again, it was like, it was like a, m- a momentum thing. And I, I, I mean, probably around about now, we, I remember going to Exeter and I think Chris Lee scored and we'd... We just hit a bit of a run there where we, we hadn't won games, you know what I mean? And you think, Brian, I, mean, I remember going to Cardiff City as well. We, we'd, we'd beaten the, uh, the playoff semis. Um, and we were 2 1 down going into injury time. And it might have been my hunter who scored. We, we got the equaliser. We, we drew 2 2. But the, I remember the crowd getting a bit restless. And I thought at the time, maybe a bit arse because we were still building the team as such. And the players were still giving everything. They just weren't getting the rub of the green. And then we, get, we went into December and we took Phil Stanton alone. Um, and we played Hull City. And we won two, I think Phil scored the two goals. We won 2 1. And that led us into Christmas, just on the outskirts of the playoff. But then over that Christmas period and going into the new year, the momentum really picked up. Um, and I can remember the Cardiff City game at home. I think uh, it was one of only four or five games on that day. And the supporters before the game had been heavy snow. And some of the supporters came up. I'll just get the snow off. I was on the pitch as well. Um, and we cleared it and we won 4-0. But it's one of those things that I'll always remember because the snow was always behind the goal and behind the goal, the uh, our end, the supporters end. And it was all piled up. And uh, Neil Grayson scored and <laughs> actually dived in the snow. But someone left a shovel, if you can remember, in the snow. <laughs> and as he dived in the snow, he, he cracked his head. And had a little cut on his head. Because someone had left a shovel in the snow, and I got, I, that sticks in my mind as much as anything. So he had to have treatment on his head after scoring. But we, the momentum started to build on that, and we, we beat we in Cardiff, um, and then Chester City, who were again near the top of the league. And I took Matthew Rush on loan from Norwich, um, and Matthew played really well that day. I remember we won five one. Now the momentum was building. And then I, I was fortunate enough that so I think Lee Madison got injured. Um, and I went to right Birmingham again and took John Frayne. Uh, again, I left back like Ian Clark soon, grew up in the same era. Honest as a day's long, terrific left foot on him. Um, and I knew he'd come and do us a fantastic job. He'd been injured at Birmingham and Barry Fry was good enough to let me have him. Um, and he'd come in, I think it was for the, the Harleypool game, the game after Chester. We won that one 3-0 as well. If I right, was Greg did Grayson get a hat trick on that one? Yeah, a, a, a really quick hat trick, I believe. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. got a very quick hat trick, and then suddenly, I think the belief started to come, and the players started to believe that we could probably. You know, I mean, we just keep this momentum going. We know we're never going to win every game, but uh, you mean know, the momentum had started to build, and it was around then that I had the belief that all we've got to do is now just keep on a straight. No, we're not going to win every game. We know that, but we've. So before we gained the momentum, the players were gaining confidence. I think there was a, 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 I think around Easter time there was a narrow loss to Wigan, and that was what sparked the really strong run into the end of the season and the playoffs and um, playoff as far as playoff semi finalists opponents go. Cardiff City, then it's a tough place to go, isn't it? A Sunday lunchtime game at Ninian Park. Um, 
and a, a situation made even harder when Mark Cooper got sent off. So I know he likes to talk about it himself, but it was a, a, a great goal from Sean Parrish and, and a fabulous result to take out of that first leg. But it was. I mean, you're right. I think we went over to there. We like we got beat one 0 by Wigan, who got promoted uh, at the end automatic, and they were a strong side that spent a lot of money. But we played exceptionally well on the day, and we got beat one 0 Then we had to make the long journey down to Torquay two days later over Easter, and you, you know, I mean, you think well, are the players affected tiredness, and we went there and we won two one, and we were straight back on track. Um, had a couple of good home games. I think with Scar, but we beat at home. And we had to go to Cambridge, which was difficult. But the, the, the defining one going into the playoffs was Fulham away. Because Fulham had, on the Tuesday, if I remember right, they'd, they'd got to Mansfield and won, um, which meant they'd got automatic promotion. So we went to Fulham under a full house. And Mickey Adams is a friend of mine. Um, and I always remember then, we got the lads and the referee, the referee always came in with the studs to do the studs and everyone, the linesman did. And I'd said to the referee before the start of the game, is it OK, like... We'll go into the centre of the pitch and we'll give the Fulham a clap on. Terrific, he said. I can't remember the referee was. Brilliant. Oh, what a lovely gesture. But what, basically what I said to the players is, right, go in the middle. But when they come out Fulham and that's what the applause, we'll run to their end. So, so well, I do it all damp on the crowd and the psychology side of it as well. And we, we did and suddenly you could feel the, the, the atmosphere of the crowd drop a little bit. And it meant Fulham were attacking their favourite end in the first half uh, or the second half. Um... And we, and we scored off a free kick and we went to Fulham who just got promoted and won one nil. That was really the start of the belief to say, yeah, we come on, we can go all the way and make that run. Obviously, last game of the season was scunt up at home. We won one nil and think it might be Paris again. But the Fulham one was, yeah, I mean, that was, remember that I think it was a Sunday, a Sunday game. And, um, we went there. Obviously, Coops got sent off. I think it was a long throw, right, but was throwing and Mark was a judge to have elbowed so much. It was a bit harsh. But we went there and we stuck it out with, with 10 men, uh, which was a difficult place to go. Um, and Paris, it, it won from about 30 yards. He did swear, I swear, now come off his shin. <laughs> and he did shin it, if you look at it again, but he's hit it and he's looped over the goalkeeper. And to go there, 10 men for a large chunk of the game um, against a good side and to come away winning 1-0, it was fantastic. So... Uh, we just got our noses in front. Um, and then he was all about doing the, the, the job in the second leg to get to Wembley. That was that was some night, that second leg, that the club getting to Wembley for the for the first time. And, um, you know, not, not too long after finishing bottom of the league and, and only staying up on a technicality to be playing under the Twin Towers and, and with a chance of promotion, it was some night, wasn't it? It was. I mean, it, we, we set off again. I think we, uh, we, we, we went one up there. The man sent off then. I can't remember who it was in who uh, I can't remember who the manager might have been on Grayson to be fair because Neil had a great habit of actually going down getting touched going down and, uh, and making it look as worse than what he was he was a tough old character so they had a man said tough and at one time we went to I think we got into a 3-1 lead and they scored right at the end but then it was fantastic I mean it rounded off for the club especially being the, the 100 years of uh, the centenary it was also I think a game as well for the people like Barry Stone, all the directors, and Barry Ward, bearing in mind, because bearing in mind, we were still in receivership and you know, more administration, whichever one it was at that time as well. So that's why the money was tight. And we got to Wembley and created a team um, while under those difficult circumstances. So to get the Wembley, we still like Barry, the directors, Barry Ward, but like I said before, it was all those people the people who stood on the te- on the, the turnstiles, the people who did the car parks, who've been at the, the county ground and with the buckets hanging out when the club was short of cash, um, who had the club at heart. They did it for nothing. It was really a game for them. I always remember saying, like, I mean, afterwards, it's, I was delighted and the players were elated, but just think how these people feel as well because they've had two years where they didn't look as though they may not have a club um, and they give their heart and soul for the club and didn't, take anything back for it so this was a, a basically a win for them and also a, a, a fantastic day out and, and achievement by the players to get to Wembley The build up to the first Wembley then what are your memories I, you know I obviously people queuing for hours for tickets the merchandise flying out the door even the players recording a song ahead of Wembley what, what were your sort of memories of those 10 days leading up to the game 
I remember the song. I remember Ian Samson on the drums. I didn't realise he could play the drums. Some say he was better at that than the centre half, but I disagreed. Um, oh, we, we, it was just a build. I mean, people always said, and I was lucky enough that I'd, I'd been to Wembley a couple of times, Everton, things of this nature. And, and everybody used to say it was the, the pitch at Wembley was so big, you know what I mean? It was tiring. It wasn't that. It was the actual build up. And you spend too much time on the build up, your energy sats for that day. And, and also at that time as well, we'd, we'd started to do, or I had started to go into the psychology of the, 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 the side of the game as well. And we had a last called Janet Knowles who came in and she started to do a lot of storyboards around the dressing rooms. We painted the dressing rooms different colours, which was soothing for us and battleship great for the opponents, <laughs> which made them feel a bit down. And the players were doing one to ones with her. We did team building and, and to felt we were a little bit innovative on that time because we, we were doing the similar kind of stuff that Bill Bezic was doing with Steve McLaren at Manchester United all these and getting great publicity for and, and all these. And, and at the time, so I, was, I was going to FA courses, do pro license and everything. And people were asking, players and coaches and managers really, were asking me about this kind of work that we were doing. And I don't think people realised that as well. We were one of the first clubs to actually engage in um, in the psychology side of it as well, so we we did all this, and it wasn't as I said before. It wasn't the pitch. Going back to the pitch, it wasn't the pitch. It was the actual build up, and uh, we made sure the players enjoyed the build up, but then also pulled them away from it. Um, and we said, this, limit your phone calls. Limit, we'll, we'll limit your press uh, engagements now and everything. Just concentrate on the game, um, and we did. To be fair, I remember, I remember we were going to Wembley, we booked the Hilton Hotel, right on Wembley, night before the game. A lot of lads, we'd say you'd go out and relax, and they'd, Sean Parrish, just with the lads who liked a little bit, they went and watched the dogs at Wembley. Fine, ain't got a problem with that. Um, and it was a really relaxed night, but we had a really good feel within the camp, and we had a sense, you know what I mean? And it's one of those that you, you get in football, which you've been a long time, you get feelings. You get feelings of to think, oh, is today our day? Or you've got a real confident inner feeling to say, it is our day. And we just felt it was our day. The game itself, everyone remembers the, the ending, the John Frayne free kick, of course, at the end. Um, is that your main takeaway? Or was it the celebrations afterwards? Or was it anything else that happened that, that sticks in your mind from that afternoon? Um, basically, I mean, you've always got to come back to Frayne's free kick. Um, but going into the, the game itself and building the game, I remember Jason Jason White had a slight problem with his cartilage. Um, so it was a decision, do we play Jason White or do I play Chris Lee? And in the end, we we, we went with Chris Lee and said to Jason, Look, at least if he comes on for half hour, he needs to go and change the game with his pace. Or if we're up um, and we need your pace to get him behind, if Swansea started to squeeze the game, um, and he was fine with that. He was just, as I said before, if it wouldn't have been for his cartilage, he would have played. Then I remember Dave Rennie coming off, who, who'd been a good, experienced player throughout the Coventries and things of Leicester City, all this kind of thing. Um, he played at Wembley before. He got injured. Um, and it was a, we were out to go to a shape that we hadn't played for a long time, which was more of a flat back four than anything. Um, and the lads coped with it particularly well. But, it wasn't what I call a terrific game. We had a good chance. I remember Sean Parrish going through and everyone kicked off the line. Exy had a, had a chance for Swansea. Woody didn't have a massive amount to do. Uh, but then we go into the into the final minute, the free kick. Um, the taking of the free kick again, which was... Um, I remember Terry Hebrion, I think he was a referee, and we had him for the following year as well against Grimsby Town. Um Terry, I think it was Dave Penny, had come out the wall quick. And Terry had lined the wall up again and John had actually moved the ball slightly and give himself a bit more room. Uh, but it's still the pressure of taking that free kick at Wembley in front of like 50 or 40 odd thousand people. Fair play to John, you know what I mean? He had the nerve to do it. And that was the quality we brought into the club when we were lucky to bring him in in January. Um, and he got the winner. From then on, God knows where happened. It was like the, the wild celebrations on the pitch. It was fantastic. But also as well, like people, the, the supporters, and the, the, if you remember right, we the, the FA or the, the Football League had asked us what 
records we wanted to play if we won. And I think you were part of it. Were you there with Nick and myself? Yes, yeah. It shows the three records, which was moving on up, rocking all over the world. And what was the other one? S- uh, Simply oh. the Best, was it? Simply the Best. Yeah. And we, we chose those three records to win. And if you remember right, those three records were played for probably about how many the next day, how many years for the winners of the yeah. playoff final. So it was enough, something else that we <laughs> contributed towards as a club with that. So, um, oh, it was just fantastic. I mean, we did the support as well three years before that. Could possibly have gone out of the league. Club may have gone out of business. Who knows? No one would know if it would have got relegated. The club would have got relegated. So it was fantastic for everybody, directors, everybody. Um, and we had, we had a terrific night on it as well, to be fair, which the players deserved. But, uh, then we had the, the open top bus around the... The town, to be fair. Yeah, I would say it wasn't just a terrific night. There was that bus parade on the Monday, and there were some fantastic scenes. The whole the whole town seemed to turn out. The sun was shining. It was a, a perfect day that that bus parade. I was. I think it was on the Sunday. I remember it again. We we, we said well, we were going on the bus, and the open top bus was fantastic. I think it was like there was a few of the lads who were a little bit late, to be fair, and they all turned up. You know, I think it was a jeep jumped onto the bus at the end and. To have that amount of people, I was at four thousand. I was lucky enough to play for Everton when we won the league title and the Cup Winners' Cup and everything. We had a tour around Liverpool, uh, but that was it was incredible. To have that amount of people around the town, they were hanging off buildings, everything. We had to stop. We could we, the, the coach stopped about every two hundred yards, so one of the lads could go out and have a little tinkle. Some of the supporters come on the coach, um, and it was just wonderful. It was, it was a wonderful day, and it was a wonderful end to the season. So, um, again, it was a collective thing, and you, you, I was pleased for everybody to be fair that we won the game. 